and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to the Wednesday... That's another thing we need to discuss, chaps. Uh, waffle, shall we say? Uh, my name's Lord Hillsborough, and with me on the line, first of all, we have Mr. Eduardo. Eddie, old boy, how the devil are you? Good evening, your lordship. It's fantastic to hear your beautiful, dulcet tones once again. Fantastic to be heard. And uh, Mr. Fudge, how are you all, boys? I'm all very, I'm all very well, sire. Uh, just having to uh, pick myself up off the floor, um, because, you know, things are happening, and uh, I'm not used to it. It's odd, isn't it? And, uh, chaps, uh, Mr. Chan here has not been the only one throwing his cash about, you know. We do have a new signing of our own, Mr. James Marriott. How are you, James, old boy? Yeah, I'm good. So we agreed it was £10,000 a week, didn't we, for this? Uh, uh, that, checks that, on the post. That was check. the contract. <laughs> To, to, to the post. <laughs> Evening, guys. <laughs> right then, chaps. So, let's get down to some business, shall we? Um, first things first, um, the new boss. Ready, aim, fire, chaps. What do you think? So, this is right. So, let me get this right. We, uh, we sacked a, a, a head coach whose name was very easy to pronounce. Yep. Despite the <laughs> fact that his, his tactics were very easy to hate. Um, yep. And we, we have now signed a man who uh, appears to be the Spengali of tactical brilliance, um, but he has a name that the closest I can get, I think, is Carlos Caravan of Love. <laughs> yeah. uh, there, was a, there was a player for one of the African teams that I think was pronounced <laughs> once, and I think this is kind of similar, and I've gone with Carlos Caravan of Love. I think, I, think, I think I've got it right. Being quite the European like what I am, um, I think that's it. I feel a bit geeky now because I, I, I have actually been practicing how to pronounce it, I as think. in genuinely. Uh, well, it's probably wrong, so I've got Carlos Cavallio. Oh, we'll, take that. we'll take that. And you see, to me, it's just, just say it fast and no one notices. Then it just gaffer that'll do for me. That's absolutely fine. <laughs> Where's <is> gaffer? <laughs> Whatever. Where's <is> gaffer? <laughs> so, um. Essentially, chaps, uh, obviously, uh, being the um, social media moguls that we are, I'm sure we've all seen what uh, the thoughts were on our new boss uh, when he first arrived. And I think the tide seems to be swaying that, uh, as a general rule, seems like a nice enough chap. And uh, what do you guys think about him? I, you know, the, the thing that interested me was, um, so we got rid of Stuart Gray, and the rumour mill started up, and uh, you know th there were the usual names kind of slotted in to, to this slot, and uh, obviously Sam Allardyce was one of them. And uh, I think no Wednesday fan ever would have thought we would have gone for a completely unknown Portuguese coach. And when his name first popped up, uh, I would say that the feeling on the social media, on the message boards, was pretty much who the hell is this clown? Uh, Chan Siri, get your hand in your pocket, you're meant to be rich, what are you doing, we're a laughing stock. And then, within literally six hours of the bloke being appointed and, and giving his first press conference in beautiful English, um, name checking and name dropping, Jose Mourinho, and talking about his plans, suddenly it seems that everyone's got on board with the idea that he is the guy who not only wrote the coaching manual, but tore it up, wrote an entirely new one, gave that one to Mourinho, and then came back and still had enough <laughs> material to write a third one. So, I think <laughs> we, we've kind of, uh, we've almost already accepted him um, as being more than what potentially his CV suggests, which in a way is worrying, but actually it's quite refreshing for Wednesday, because usually we're absolutely giving pelters to anybody who can't, you know, on day one, live up to Jack Chartner and Atkinson. So, I... <laughs> I'm actually quite... Uh, I think we've turned over a new leaf. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> Shock yeah. horror. Is that Beastie? Is Beastie back? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody, somebody's got to fly that flag out. You will not want slagging him off. That's how he said it. No, I, t I tell you what it was. Right, like, like, like you said, Eddie, we had the, the rumour mill going round. Big Sam was, was touted. And unfortunately for, for Carlos Carvalho, um, <laughs> he... He was appointed officially the day after Big Nige uh, became available. Do you know what I mean? And that that was never going to win any favours with well with anybody. And, and you're right, yeah. If you, you know, a good um, a good chunk of the the Wednesday phase full of have, have got behind the coach. And I like that they have. It, it's it's nice. Do you know what I mean? It's lovely because we are a romantic bunch. Do you know what I mean? We we love rooting for the underdog, as it were. But let's every, have a every time I look at Tango, I always think romance. Romance. I, I, just, 
It's like that scene in Wayne's World. Dream Weaver. <laughs> That's what it's like. But let's just look at the stats. I mean, there is getting away from the fact that this is the quintessential. I mean, textbook. It, there'll be a picture of him and Trevor Benjamin when you look up the word journeyman in in a dictionary. I mean, he he. he, he I, I don't think he stayed at a club for longer than two years. Well, is that not sort of modern management? How many managers do stay at a club more than two years? Yeah, and a lot of his time's been at clubs in like um, in Turkey and in Portugal and places like that where you lose six games and, and you're out of a job. I think there are two issues, though, with the new guy that we need to address. One being his now quite embarrassing overuse of the word massive in every <laughs> sentence. <laughs> that, 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 that's why it's a fan favourite already, Jim. <laughs> that started from the first line of the, his, uh, his press conference speech and has, has not stopped since. Uh, and the other was the fact that at Alfreton, despite nearly 10 minutes of singing Carlos Give Us a Wave, nothing. So no wave. Like, not a thing. You might not have understood. It was mainly Tango that was leading those chants, and I'm not sure how many Shandis Tango had had, <laughs> but it wasn't entirely uh, legible. In, in Carlos' defence, uh, Tango's accent shouting Give Us a Wave is impenetrable and, and completely incomprehensible to most of us from Sheffield, <laughs> let alone uh, a bloke who's just uh, just flown in from Braga. Pretty true. <laughs> so, all in all, chaps, uh, personally, I was dubious. I am dubious. We don't know what kind of gap is going to be like yet. Um, from what I've seen, obviously, he keeps cracking the, uh, the attacking football flag. Of course, there are the sceptics out there that um, have mentioned that he has got the job because of his connections in the game with Mr Mourinho. Um, Pete McKee did a, a wonderful, wonderful picture of it on, on uh, the, the Twitter sphere. I'm sure you've all seen that, chaps. Uh, of course, going back to uh, the, uh, the big Nige debate, uh, there are some sceptics out there um, that really say that he was introduced at that time on that day to stop all the, uh, uh, the big Nige speculation comes hundred percent hundred percent if it, yeah if, if you don't believe that then you're an idiot well the the place <laughs> i read it is from um the war of the monster trucks uh blog which is a fantastic blog by, by the way if uh, anybody out there wants to have a little nose a brilliant chapter very old fanzine um so yeah have a little nose at that so uh, yeah and um obviously looking at the new structure if you like at uh, hillsborough which is something we've uh, we, we, we're going to take a bit of getting used to i think chaps uh, mm -hmm. are you happy with this this committee uh, venture, or uh, would you prefer the old gaffer, if you like? It's scary, isn't it? It's it's different. It's it's unusual. It's very strange to to hear the chairman at the the press conference last week saying quite openly, "I will have the final say on on signings." That he's going to be the one that makes those those big calls. Which is why when you when we were talking about who might be coming in as manager, you've got to realise that probably. 80% of managers out there don't want to work in, in, in that kind of environment. So mm. it is what it is. It's something new. Um, do you know what? I think it's going to be nine months before we can really judge it. Uh, we've got to see what, what happens. But, you know, so far, so good. How, how nice it is to have uh, a pre-season and a summer where we're, we're actually excited, where we're, we're going on, on Twitter excited to see what's happened over the last few hours because we right. genuinely think we might have missed something. I've not slept in days. <laughs> I've not slept. I think that's more due to your habits than anything else. Your Wednesday. <laughs> and the interesting thing is that you know Chancery, by his own admission, is not a football man. So obviously, he has to surround himself with football people. Um, but I think it is interesting that he still feels confident enough. I know it's his money, of course he's, he's entitled to do what he wants with it, but I think he still feels confident enough to keep his own counsel on those final decisions. So it looks like, you know, as it stands at the moment, uh, you know, Mr Caravan of Love is going to be doing the, um, the, you know, the tactics side of it and he's going to be getting the best out of the players that, that land on his doorstep and that's absolutely fine. But it looks like there's, there's kind of the, the other two legs of the stool um, you know, we have the, the business side of it, which is obviously related to the purse strings in, in terms of recruitment, and we've got the, um, the you know, the, the, the scouting and the, the uh, player identification and the, the commercial contractual stuff, which is obviously in Glen Roder's court. But it's interesting that both of those actually filter back up to Mr. Chancery to the point where he not only is going to have a veto on 
um, you know, we're going to spend X amount of money on this particular player, but also we're going to target a sort of player who is going to fit into a certain system. And it seems clear to me that we are recruiting based on Mr. Chancery's desire to have a certain style of play, if not a certain you know, tactical outlook, but certainly he wants to see some you know, attacking football, he wants to see passing attractive stuff. But also the sort of players that we're going for, with them not being the obvious, we've got a bit of cash, we're going to flash it, let's, you know, let's buy all of the, the big names that we've seen in the championship in the last 12 months, we're actually looking at players who, presumably there is some good science, there's some good data behind this, these are the right players who will fit into a system that has been decided. And I, love I it. for one, I'm excited because for 15 years, we've tried the, the ex-players, we've tried the big names, we've tried the this and the that, and what we've come up with, it, by and large, has been a bit rubbish. I love it. I love it. I think it brings us up to date. I think, yeah. I think this, is, this is the way that the game is nowadays. For me, what the, what the greatest thing is, is have you seen that thing during the rounds of um, Barnsley Mick talking about our approach for <laughs> Daryl? Yeah. I, I think it's amazing. I, I, I love the audacity of Glenn Rhoda going, yeah, you know your best player, yeah? Can we have him for a year and, you know, that's it? Can we just borrow him? Like, I love that. I love that. I love, that. I love, I love that there's just, you know, this is how it works. And, and then the coach is a coach. He's literally just there to drill the training ground and, and he needs to be the tactician. And all the nonsense, everything that, as British football fans, we attach to being a, 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 an English football manager... Is is just completely taken away from him, and I think I think it's great. I think it's it's up to date, it's modern, and it's alien to a club like ours. It's been a long time, hasn't it? Since basically Sheffield Wednesday has stood up, unzipped its flies, got it slung on the table, and gone have a look at the size of that because that's effectively <laughs> what Rhodes has done with that, hasn't he? He's gone Daryl Murphy. Yeah, he'd probably fit into our system. We'll have him on loan. Yes or no? Your decision. <laughs> you know, and that's it. It's been, it's been ages since we've done that. And that, it's refreshing. It's a bit of aggression, isn't it? It's a, it's yeah. a bit of it's a bit of us us kind of standing up for ourselves, um, or or the the much more elegant way that you described it a minute ago, um, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and and saying this is this is what we're going to do. And um, yeah, you're right. It's something that's 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 certainly new for us. It's it's fairly new for English football. But I think you know probably the best example is what Southampton have done. And when when Pochettino went went there, everyone was like, who the heck's this? Yeah. Um, and the thing is, there the structure is such that the head coach is entirely replaceable. One one leaves, someone else comes in. And even the playing staff, uh, as we've seen with Southampton, they they last summer lost. You would you would guess you would say half their their good their best players left, and they replaced them, and they did even better the following season. And that's how that system works. That no one one player is bigger than the club. That any player that leaves, there's, there's a, they've already got five or six other candidates that they've identified, and yet it's probably mainly stat based. But they can bring in other players that can take over, and the whole machine rolls on. Um, and you know, I think if it's if you look at Southampton, you go say that's a huge success. If we can emulate that in any way, I'll 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 grab that right now. Absolutely, uh, grab that slung, old boy. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, of course we can't go much further, chaps, without uh, discussing Mr. Gray. I mean, I for one was a little shocked, shall we say, uh, when the the news did appear. Uh, well, maybe not so much shocked. I mean, he's done a cracking job for the club. Uh, we all know what type of football he played. Why on earth we didn't sort of retain him in his old role as essentially a defensive coach? I'm not quite sure. Maybe Mr. Gray didn't want that role after being a gaffer for some time, but I think it's fair to say he's done a, a decent job I was with in charge, yeah? He's yeah. proved himself, hasn't he, to the point where um, he could probably go go off now and get a, a head coach or a manager's job anywhere Certainly in the bottom two divisions, and uh, you know, and maybe even in the championship. I think he's uh, he's been a good servant to the club. I think I mean, um, his his release, the fact that he's no longer with us, is actually even more evidence of a, a new philosophy that's, that's weird, coming yeah. to Sheffield Wednesday. Um, and Stuart Gray, for whatever reason, I'm sure some of it was that pride of, of effectively being uh, offered a demotion to a def you know defensive role or a less uh, less involved coaching role. Um, I think that probably informed his decision, but uh, I, I can't. I can't look now at the players that we've signed since and the way that we're looking to set up, and imagine Stuart <laughs> Gray as the fulcrum of that system. So it, it's, it's a horses for courses thing for me. But as always, you know, we, we thank him for his efforts and we wish him all the best. Yeah, absolutely, he can leave with his head 
held high, can't he? I think that it's been interesting seeing all the people kind of tweeting the list of players that we released and who we've replaced them with, and you see the step up in quality. And then you think back to the squad that we had last season, you think, actually, it really wasn't that good. So for us to have finished where we finished, he, he really overachieved with the players that he got. So he's, he's, he's got to be proud of that. And you're right, I, I, I hope that he does get another job. I hope he gets a championship job at some point, because I think that um, the guy you know, really did himself proud. I think he. Uh, I think he's obviously concentrated on his uh, book writing career because uh, <laughs> the, there's a book came out and uh, I tell you what, he's led quite the life as Stuart Vineyard. Got to mention football in it. Dirty old man. <laughs> Angel on the training ground, <laughs> devil in the bedroom. That's what I. Mean. He had that look about him. Ever since he stopped saying as such, it was all going downhill from there. <laughs> And of course, we have another out since we last spoke, chaps. Uh, Mr. Kirkland, um, obviously uh, just a cracking player for the club, but can we expect a player like that to sit on the bench for another season? Uh, to my mind, no. He's too good to be a second keeper. Uh, fair play, all the best. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, I don't think I've ever seen before a, a player who, who leaves a, a club by, by rejecting the, uh, the contract offer. And the club themselves actually put a story on their own website saying that someone has rejected that contract and the reasons why. But anyone that read that, I think, would have just thought, Do you know what, Chris, fair enough. He waited until the first day of pre-season as well and came in to, to, you know, to give the news yeah. uh, to management's face. And that... What a class act. You know, you, you know the guy, is. he takes pride in being a real professional. Um, and that, to me, is a really, really classy gesture. And I think if it, if it was anyone other than, uh, than Kieran Westwood in that Wednesday net, I think that Kirkham would still be nailed on to be one of the better Absolutely. players in the championship. And yeah. I'm, I'm sure he'll get a, a role somewhere. And part of me thinks... He'll get a role somewhere, and it'll probably uh, it'll probably cost us a point or two this season because he will end up playing against Wednesday, and uh, and he'll probably do as great a job for whichever club he is lucky enough to get his services um, as he has done for us. So you know, best luck the, to him. I saw on the social media today he's actually on, on trial at Burnley. Why on earth? Um, wow. Is, there's any kind of a trial involved? I mean, crikey, yeah, Kirkland's a, clearly anybody can see he's a belting keeper. So uh, you'd imagine it'd just be a case of uh, open the doors and, and come on in, old boy. But tip. I suppose that's football for these days, chaps. Uh, right, so let's crack on. In, gentlemen. It's been a rather exciting time. Seven signings so far. Um, let's start off. Mr. Vin, and I apologise in advance for my pronunciation. <laughs> uh, my rather posh Yorkshire tongue does not get round anything other than buys on very well. Uh, Mr. Vincent Sazzo on a year long loan from Braga. Um, discuss. I, 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 I don't I don't know anything about any of them. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm really struggling. I really am. I, I, as soon as I, I, I... My fingers can't refresh quick enough on Twitter. And then when they do, my fingers can't move fast enough on Wikipedia. Mate, we have built this show <laughs> on certain assumptions. One of those assumptions is that you are a European cosmopolitan football genius. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I wanted a, an anecdote from you that six months ago you had a lovely meal with Vincent Sasso <laughs> and his girlfriend in a harbour somewhere in Torremolinos. Yeah, no, nothing, nothing. I've, I've, got, I've got a few bits on a few others. My favourite that, we'll, that we'll get to is um, Sheffield Wednesday perennial target Patrick Clivert. Uh, that we've brought up many a time on this show <laughs> was the manager of our first sign of the season, Daryl Lachman, which I found hilarious. Lachman, Lachman, L- 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 I don't know. Uh, well, the, the, the best, the only thing I know about this chap is he's uh, posted a, a wonderful video, or one of his uh, gentleman friends has posted a wonderful video of his journey from Holland to Sheffield. Uh, it's about nine minutes long and shows him on the car in the uh, boat in the hotel room, and then in Sheffield. <laughs> That's a little bit worrying. As, as he Friends never left video, his hometown, he's, if, he's, if he's doing you know, video highlights of his first major journey. <laughs> it's incredible. He even show, the, the very beginning of the video is him filling up the car with petrol for his long journey. I mean, obviously, he's got to get his car to Sheffield, but do we need to see that? 
So I've not, I've not seen this video, but I regret it because it sounds riveting. It's fantastic. <laughs> and the other thing about this chap, of course, is uh, if you have a little flick through his Twitter feed uh, from days gone by, he uh, describes himself as Mr. Orgasm. <laughs> Lovely stuff. <laughs> he, uh, he, he sounds like quite the treat. If we look at, at who we've signed, I would actually go so far as to say that Never mind what I said before about data and, and uh, statistics yep. and things like that. I actually think we're just signing boy band members yes. who happen to have played top flight football. This is why Chris Coken left. This well, <laughs> oh, poor Chris. Look, if, the, if there was ever a need for an ACDC tribute band and he's a very, very <laughs> lanky guitarist, he's got the hat absolutely perfect. So, um, no, if there's one thing that has struck me specifically about Vincent Sasso, and look, I'm a, I'm a married man and I'm, I'm upwards of 63% heterosexual, but <laughs> Vincent Sasso is a beautiful human being. I, I don't even care how well he plays. He could play like Patrick Blondo, and I think I would still be in love. <laughs> he is a beautiful man. And I think if we're, if we're going to be signing players, I think we should be doing it with the mind to filling that West Stand with impressionable teenage girls. Okay. Why not? You sound like you've thought about that far too much, mm. Eduardo. <laughs> you, you sound very much like a, 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 an 80s TV star. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right, so, uh, there is a couple of uh, exceptions to that rule, of course. Uh, the chap, Mr Alex Lopez, obviously uh, popped again another loan signing from uh, Celta Vigo. Um, I've seen tweets... Um, that may suggest that he could possibly work in the Sheffield kebab shop. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've seen these as well. <laughs> Maybe the less said, the better. I mean, don't get me wrong, the videos I've seen, and again, obviously, we only see the highlights on the videos. It looks like a cracking player, chaps. He, he likes a bit of a, a, a screamer, by, by all accounts. Uh, well, we're back onto Mr. Orgasm there, aren't we? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, for, for me, I almost don't really care who he is. Just the fact that we Sheffield Wednesday have signed someone from La Liga, that's, that's all we need to know. That's brilliant. And, and apparently he had the choice to, to, to stay at La Liga as well. Yeah. But yeah it, looks like, it, it looks useful, doesn't it? It looks really useful. Uh, uh, interestingly, a lot of the, um, the, the, the Spanish football experts in Twitter's journalism fraternity... Um, are expressing legitimate surprise that he has dropped down, as they say, to the championship. Uh, yeah. Because the view was, OK, he wasn't an ever-present um, for, for Celta Vigo, but he certainly was a player who saw a lot of action. I think it was in 25 appearances last season, including, you know, com coming off the bench and scoring the winner against Atletico Madrid. You know, that's, uh, it, you know, this is a guy who understands how to play at the top, at the top level. Um, yeah, this, would, this is the one I'm excited He would be the, the perfect sort of player who would be coming, you know, looking, looking to chase the, uh, the Premier League pound and signing for, uh, you know, a, a team in the lower reaches of the Premier League. But for him to, to come here, albeit on loan, but for a season-long loan, uh, I think, you know, we have obviously sold the idea of, of whatever the project is. And I think um, the, idea, the fact that we're signing basically all of Portugal and Spain, yeah. I, I think is a huge part of it, that, that he sees that we are going to be uh, creating... Something that, you know, he isn't, he isn't going to have to make a mental gear shift to understand. I suspect that he'll be asked to do exactly the same sort of thing that he would be doing playing um, in the top flight in Spain or in Portugal. Yeah, I think you can see from the type of players that we're signing, like you were saying earlier about fitting into a system, there's a lot of attacking midfielders coming in. So uh, you can tell we're going to go for that rather continental 4-3-3, which I'm actually, or 4-5-1, however you pronounce it. I'm actually quite excited about it, if I'm honest. And um, just on the interest of uh, being the European correspondent of this show, um, for Braga, Vincent Sasso... Uh, used to be managed by a Portuguese beautifully named goalkeeping sensation, Quinn. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, one of my favourite ever football names. Yeah, Quinn. Quinn used to be his manager, so uh, <laughs> he, he knows he what he's getting doing. getting under us. Quinn. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what it, what it was, just as I Google his name while, we, while we're all chatting away, um, it said people who search for this also search for Quinn. I thought, oh. Lovely stuff. <laughs> Carlos out, Quinn in. <laughs> so, yes, uh, but Mr. Lopez, Orgasm right there. <laughs> Lopez, for me, is one of the ones I'm excited about because he clearly knows this, um, this style of football that we're going for, with him coming from, obviously, you know, that, the same background. And, um, and it's, it's a, 
like you say, the, the Spanish newspapers are a bit, um, well, Christ, this is a bit of a step down for him. But let's not, let's not forget, he is, he did go down to the, uh, to the reserves and he's done very well in the reserves and he signed and Celta have signed him for another three years. Mm -hmm. So they've got, they've got him in their plans and they're going to use us as a way of getting him into competitive football. And like you said, that might, and he, he's happy to do it because it puts him in the shop window in one of the richest countries, you know, in terms of European football. So, um, it's, I, I think it could be win-win for everybody with this one. It's nice to think that we've got people associated with our club now that can sell us to players who've got offers coming in from all over the place. That w whatever our chairman or advisors or whoever it is that's talking to these players, and I think we're led to believe that Glenn Road has spent the last few years building up his contacts around Europe, so, so maybe it's him that's out there kind of selling Sheffield Wednesday to, to players. Because I think for, for, for years, really, we've... We've kind of had people around the club that have been not quite embarrassed, but we've not we, we've not really had anything to shout about. The, the, there's no real reason for players to want to come here, uh, and yet suddenly we're we're attracting interest from these kind of players, and that's that's brilliant. It brings a tear to my eye. Absolutely. Uh, so let's have a little look at some of the chaps we might know a little bit more about. Uh, first of all, Jack Hunt again, uh, one year loan from Palace. Uh, looks like a belter to me, chaps. I've seen him play uh, quite a lot, obviously, um, and. Uh, it seems like the kind of block we need to replace uh, what we've lost in the defenders that have gone. Well, I think I think it's uh, personally speaking, I think it's a great signing. I think uh, getting rid of Matic and Buxton were completely the right choice, completely the right thing to do, and to get somebody in like like Jack Hunt, um, I'm I'm chuffed with. But I think the most the most the bit that annoys me though, just just that little bit, is that we've got him from bloody Crystal Palace along with this other uh, this this goalkeeper. Like, I, I hate straight up despise Crystal Palace. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and, we're, and we're now we're, we're walking down there going, "Have you got any more rejects that you don't want? Yeah, we'll take them off your hands, kids." Do you know what I mean? No, it's fine. Do you know what I mean? You spent too long down on that south coast, fomenting <laughs> a rivalry with with teams that we couldn't care less about. Yeah, I know, that's it. That's it. That, yeah, yeah. I've been down here. I'm like, "Oh, I hate Crystal Palace," and, and don't don't come near me having to Waterlooville. Bloody hell! You know what I mean? <laughs> That bloody crawly town. <laughs> it's got it's got good potential for a new song as well, Jack Hunt. Because um, <laughs> what what rhymes with Hunt? Uh, punt. Quim. 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 <laughs> <laughs> if we can have, if we can start a song that actually honours the great Kenny Lunt, then I will, I'll be happy because he he failed to do so in his own time at Ilfra, So I'm going to work on this. This is my challenge before the start of the season. <laughs> Of course, as, uh, as you mentioned, we've also got Lewis Price. Uh, again, uh, he actually came on a free from, from Paul. As we released him, and we've uh, sort of scooped him up. Knocking on the door of 30, which I know for a keeper is not incredibly old, but it seems like a decent backup. Oh, yeah, exactly. I think you, you've nailed it there, Lord. It's, it's a solid backup, no more. I think at the start of last season, we looked at our two keepers, and I don't think any Wednesday fan really knew which way it was going to go, who was, who was going to be the, uh, the first choice keeper, who was going to be the backup. I think. We are very, very clear on this. You know, we have got the best keeper in this division. Um, we need a, a competent, <laughs> experienced backup. Mm. Uh, and we've got it in price. So I, I'm more than happy with it. Is it a statement of intent? No, not really. I think it's just the case that, you know, you physically need enough bodies and bodies of a certain quality to be able to deal with any eventuality. And we've still got uh, young Mr Dawson as well, uh, sort of hiding away in the background, which uh, obviously he's had his, his international caps at a, a young age and, and that kind of thing. And, I mean, keepers are one of the things that I personally look at. I'm a bit of a, a keeper geek, if you like, but uh, he looks like a bit of a prospect coming through, chaps, sort of ready and waiting. Uh, we, uh, we, we're, t we're still talking, you know, four or five years, though, I think. But Absolutely. It's, it, it's very rare, isn't it, that you find a keeper like, you know, like a Joe Hart, who, who really bursts onto the scene and, and makes a... Uh, um, you know, senior job his own at that sort of age. I, you know, I agree with you. I think, you know, keepers obviously last an awful lot longer than outfield players. Uh, I look at a 32 year old keeper in the same way that I look at a 25 year old, uh, outfield player. So, yeah. you know, I, I, I think we've, we, you know, in, uh, in Dawson and Wildsmith, I think we've actually got some, some, some real potential there for the future. But, um, I'd like to see them maybe do, you know, spending 10 years in the Kevin Freshman role of, uh, <laughs> of basically not playing any games at all and, and warming up much more experienced keepers. And then it turns out, yeah, guess what? They're actually top class themselves. So, and we yeah, wondered I, why Kevin Freshman got fat. 
We all, we all sat there thinking, how has this happened as a professional bloody footballer? I prefer the term chunky. Oh, I tell you, I need to, I need to just, just on, uh, on the side note, while we're on the subject of keepers, I just want to say fair play to Rich O'Donnell for yeah. getting his move. I, I think he's, he's deserved it, and I think when he left our club, I, I was, you know, sad, sad to see it go because it's nice that a local, you know, youth player comes through, but for him to, you know, t t take his leave, go down to Walsall, somewhere like that, and then get a bit, what, what's perceived as a big move to Wigan, it, fair play. Absolutely. Yeah, good luck Absolutely. Uh, right, to Ross Wallace, again, another free one-year deal um, for Ross Wallace after being released from Burnley. Um, this is a belter to me, chap. Over the moon with this one. He's, he's a big old unit, isn't he? He certainly is. I saw him at Alfreton. He's not, he's not small. Um, but I tell you, he, he really showed his class, I thought, at Alfreton. He, he can, he, he's not scared to take on a man. Uh, his, his experience in this division is, is great. He's won promotion from the championship before. Uh, he's, he's perfect for what, what I think we're trying to build. Um, so um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what he's, what he's got in store for us this season. Uh, last one, chaps. Uh, we've spent some money, some real hard Mula Grundy cash uh, with a, uh, an attacking midfielder, uh, Mr. Macro. And again, I'm going to more of this. I've, I've been trying to decide how to pronounce it. Is it Matas? Matis? Matas. Thank you. Again, it looks ever so slightly like he could be working in the kebab shop with uh, <laughs> Mr. Lopez. But, chaps. Reported, obviously, undisclosed fee, but reported of around about three million euros. Two and a half million quid. What was the last player we signed at two and a half million quid? So, certainly, it's it's a step change for us, isn't it? That? And I Ooh. think, actually, that the fact that we're spending that sort of money on, um, uh, on Marco actually shows the importance of getting the right players uh, into the system that we're creating. Again, not a player that anyone has really heard of. He hasn't been on the radar, um, you know, for, for UK football fans. However, you look at his pedigree, you look at the sort of player he is, and then you look at actually what he's achieving, his deliverables. To score 15, 17 goals in the league from the wing is the sort of return that, that you need to get out of the championship. You know, there are key positions uh, in, that all of these promotion winning teams have. They have a striker who bags goals 20 plus a season and they have a supporting cast. I can't remember the last time that we had a player um, that, you know, th that had that sort of return from, from anywhere in midfield, let alone out on the flanks. You know, I think we have to go back to, um, you know, 92, 93, where, you know, that Sheridan would get double digits every season to get to that point where you've actually got players chipping in from, uh, you know, from, from all kinds of different positions. I think he's going to be the revelation of the season for me. This is the, the, the single transfer that we've made so far that has got me the most excited because it demonstrates two things. Number one, that we're, we're thinking outside the box and getting players who are going to fit the system that has been devised. But number two, that when we find a player that fits it, even though he's not a household name, we are willing to do what it takes to secure his services. What I really like about, about this is that um, if you think of a an equivalent British player, you're probably talking a six or seven million pound player. Yeah. So the, the fact that our setup now allows us to go and find these players who, yeah, fair enough, he's, he's unknown. We, we can look at his stats and we can see the videos of him and realise that, you know, he, he looks like he's, he's a good little player and he's, he's going to do a good job for us. But the fact that we're able to do that and, and, and quite shrewdly do that and do it in a way that makes business sense, which allows us to still have some, some money left in the pot to go out and, and buy our marquee striker or whoever's on the way next. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's real testament to the system that we're um, building up. And, and just to answer the point from earlier on, because I do know the answer to this, the last time we spent two and a half million pounds on a player was Wim Yonk. Wow. <laughs> Jim Wong. So I'm hoping that's not for the kiss of death on yeah. that one. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, he he I'm worked out really well for us, didn't he? He was great. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, looking at Vim Yonk and um, also Glenn Roder, do they not look like extras out of something like Pan's Labyrinth? <laughs> look, when you look at the face, they've got, they've got like faces like folded five pound notes, haven't they? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, look, I mean, right, just, just, just like, like we're saying about this system and, and, and the way it all fits in. Now, the fact that we've heavily, heavily gone to the Iberian 
areas in, in Portugal specifically. And the fact that we've even got, by virtue of the fact that we've got Carvalho as the manager. Um, do you think that's where Roda has focused his attentions in recent years? He, he's managed to learn a fair bit about these Portuguese leagues and we've managed to get, like you say, an equivalent of a six or seven million pound player, uh, 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 you know, uh, out of a league that essentially no, nobody knows nothing about. And do you think that our recruiting system has now tapped into maybe a vein that was previously, you know, untouched? I think the system has worked in favour of finding the coach and the players that we've found in that part of the world. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. It'll be, I, I wouldn't want us to become, a, you know, a kind of Portuguese ghetto. Um, but at the same time, when we've got a talismanic <laughs> a player, ghetto. like, <laughs> I mean, look, I studied history. There were loads of Portuguese ghettos. Listen, everywhere. If, if you've been to Boston near Skegness and, and seen the, the Portuguese influence there, Jesus, that's not, that's not something anybody wants. <laughs> Sorry, Emily, I apologise for interrupting. Go ahead. <laughs> so when you know when, when we've got this this influx of of Portuguese and Iberian players, etc., that yes, they're coming into some a, a club where <laughs> everything is in flux, and they you know they're almost creating their own system. They're turning up at the ground floor on day one, etc. But guess what? We have got as our talisman in that squad Jose Semedo, who is basically Portugal's greatest export. Since <laughs> You know, since, since Port, let's be honest. So, yeah. uh, uh, I I think it's actually a masterstroke because Semedo is basically just going to get them all together. They're going to have some some you know some tapas. I, you know, I'm not very good with Portugal. I don't know what they do. They you know they're going to bullfight. They're going to do whatever it is that they do in Portugal, um, <laughs> and, and they're they're going to feel at home instantly. And Semi is going to absolutely bore the pants off them about how great this club is and how massive we are and how this is home and this is family. And it's going to become more to them than just the next stop on their you know their career transfer list, etc. Absolutely. It uh, sort of harks back to uh, our very own Ginger Mourinho you know, taking them up the cup, uh, is <laughs> my phrase. Uh, but yeah, just showing them what, what the club's about. Uh, right, so, um, obviously, chaps, we, we, we've all seen it all on, on Facebook, on Twitter, on in the papers. We quite simply seem to be linked with every chuffer at the moment. Um, the, if some of the things are to be believed that we've seen, the, the amount of money we'd be spending would just be incredible because everybody in the mothers on the way to Hillsborough. <laughs> oh, chaps, breaking news. Uh, Kirkland has actually signed a two-year deal now with Bury. Um, so he's uh, all been signed up with oh. Murray. So he's, he's got himself a job, bless him. All the best, dude. Good on, Mr. Kirk. Well, that's great, but I, th- I think he's selling himself short there. I think as, as do I. He'll, he'll get first team football, won't he? Uh, am I right in thinking as well that this evening, um, did I read correctly that, that Sheffield United lost at home to Worksop Town? As Look, well, we, we've already talked about teams that we don't care about in the form of <laughs> Crystal Palace. So let's, let's, let's only spend a little bit of time talking about the hilariousness of Sheffield United losing 3-1 at home to Worksop Town. Another good thing we do have to pop in at this point. At the time of recording, Sheffield United are still the only um, professional English club left to mm. sign a player. To make a signing. <laughs> that, that, no, that can't be true because they've got game-changing investment. They, they have. I've heard they're backed by the Saudi royal family. So presumably they have got literally endless amounts of cash to spunk on full backs with a beard. Unfortunately, I've, I've heard rumours that the Saudi um, royal family are more interested in camel racing than they are in football. <laughs> and those camels aren't cheap, chaps. When you get a professional camel on the go, my word. <laughs> <laughs> I do hope uh, our uh, rather noisy poor little cousins uh, do... Uh, well, no, I don't. Stuff them. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, at this juncture, chaps, uh, basically, madness ensues. There's all sorts of rumours find out. Uh, £10 million has been put aside for a striker. Um, obviously, bringing a striker to our club at the moment is going to cost us money in wages. And if Mr Chang here is going to spend that money, fair play to him. But I think it's, it's just a case of watch this space, because, again... It's just madness out there. Absolute madness. There are kind of three, four names that, that keep kind of coming back again and again. And they're all players that you would look at and think they could fit within the system. They're all players that, that are adaptable to two or three different formations. Uh, they are players that score 20 goals a season. Uh, they're, they're generally speaking British players. And we heard the, the, the chairman and the manager last week talking about 
how important they thought it was to get a couple of, of British players in as well. Um, I, I personally would be surprised if we don't see one of them through the door before the weekend. All right, let's let's mention them. Let's touch wood. Right. Let's mention them. All right, three for me that excite me. Marshall, Bamford, and um, forgot the other one, even though I did it really dramatic then. Hooper. Yes. Don't do yes. that again for the dramatic effect of for the podcast. No, it's all right. I left it up, but we're just going to style <laughs> it out. <laughs> what do you reckon? Patrick Bamford, for me, is a marquee signing. Yeah, we probably yep. might only get him on loan, but when he was at Nottingham Forest and he was a child... He was still scoring goals. And then Chelsea bought him when they were, you know, Chelsea are Chelsea. And you think, Christ, why, why is he even gone there? And then, and then when I found he was on loan at Middlesbrough last year, I mean, look, look at the goals he scored there. Yeah, yeah, he'd be an absolute beauty of a signing. He, he's the one, isn't he? he he's the, for me, he's the one. Uh, he's an intelligent footballer. Uh, even for someone that's still quite young, he's an intelligent footballer. He scores goals. Um, and he's got really lovely hair. He's got to be the one. He's got to be the one. I tell you what, this Wednesday calendar is going to be beautiful. <laughs> For me, Bamford is the one, and uh, and that's actually more about the fact that because I'm I'm living up here within touching distance of Middlesbrough fans, it would just be brilliant to rub their faces um, <laughs> of getting Bamford on, on them for a season. Uh, do I believe that he's really in the frame? Uh, no, I don't. I, I also don't believe that Jordan Rhodes... Um, his potential. I think Daryl Murphy is massively overpriced if we're going to be looking at £4 million for him. Um, so I, I'm taking it all with a little bit of a pinch of salt, to be honest. I, I honestly believe that we're keeping our powder dry finance-wise for a big marquee striker. But there's part of me that thinks that actually we're going to be looking to kind of shock the world in a different way. I think that we might be looking to either... Um, Pull one of the cream of the, uh, the the very young players that are at one of the top teams. You know, the players who are just breaking through into, you know, the Chelsea's, the, 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 the Man City's, the Man United's. Or I think we might look to that, again, like Portugal, that kind of second tier of, uh, of first divisions, if you know what I'm, sa- you know what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. And maybe you look at maybe a player who, who scored for fun in Portugal or in France or in Austria or somewhere like that. And actually, we end up getting a, a lot more bang for our buck that way because we've got a player who isn't, isn't, doesn't have a vastly inflated English transfer fee, but does have real true pedigree. And we're persuading him to effectively step down the division to, uh, you know, to come and make his name in the UK. I want that signing that when, when we saw that Derby County had signed Bent, yeah. you know what I mean? One of them. And you think, yeah. Yeah, now now we're in. Now we're playing. I'd, I'd, I'd love one of them. So I've I got think, two think... words for you, Fudgy. Emil and Heskey. <laughs> <laughs> you can keep your two words to yourself, old boy. <laughs> uh, right, so, chaps, uh, let's, let's, let's freshen things up a little bit. I think we've droned on about uh, football for, for quite long enough. Uh, uh, how about we have a, a little get-to-know-you session with our, our new signing ourselves? Uh, uh, James. Hello. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, what's your name? Where are you from? Yeah, um, well, I'm, I'm James. Um, I'm 34. It feels a little bit like um, an AA meeting, this. It's, um, <laughs> bad memories. It's, it's, Welcome, uh, James. It's, it's basically Tinder. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm James. I'm 34. Um, I sit on the North Stand. I go to the majority of away games. Um, sort of in, in Wednesday week tradition, I feel I have to give you a little bit of material that you can use to uh, rip me to shreds in, in future weeks. Yep. So I, I do have to confess at this point that I am Barnsley born and bred. Right. <gasps> Noted. Uh, I, however, I do now live in S11, uh, unfortunately, worryingly close to the other lot. Did the, uh, uh, did the wickets clear up when you left? or? <laughs> Yes. Um, well, let's move on. Um, the, also keeping a Wednesday week um, tradition, bearing in mind that I'm, I'm um, filling the boots vacated by Beastie, um, I've sort of continued his long-running tradition of drinking several pints beforehand tonight. Good man. Oh, nice. Um, nice. Really enjoying a, a lovely bottle of Twin Peaks by Thornbridge, which is very nice. <laughs> yeah. oh, you're, oh, you're a man after my own heart already. I, I think this guy's a keeper. 
I'm already <laughs> But you know, it, it's, uh, it's quite nerve-wracking taking over from BC. It's quite a big responsibility. His, his <laughs> tweets when he was trying to find Charlton away a couple of years ago, that was <laughs> absolute comedy genius. I can't copy it with that. Do, do, you, want, do you want to hear about um, the, the rather awful story of my first Wednesday match? Yeah. Right away. So it was my first game. It was a beautiful sunny day, May 1990. Um, and I'll be interested to see whether or not... Uh, oh, you're <laughs> kidding me. You remember this. Nottingham Forest at Hillsborough. Oh, my oh. God. <laughs> so um, I was 10 years old, and I, I'd not been particularly interested in football. So I lived in Barnsley with my mum. My dad lived in Sheffield. That's where I at the weekends. He was a big Wednesday fan. Um, and obviously, Forest at home, last game of the season. Um, and massive game. Wednesday, of course, needed a result to, to stay up in the old first division. So my dad wanted to go to the match. So he comes and picks me up, and he goes, Oh, surprise today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it's the football. So I was like, oh, all right. Not, not really too bothered about it. So uh, we went along. It was an absolutely gorgeous day. It was red hot. It was lovely. Um, but, of course, on the day, it, it was going to take quite an unusual set of circumstances for Wednesday to be relegated. But this is Wednesday, so that happened. And uh, we lost 3-0. Wednesday were relegated. So there's 30,000 Wednesday fans in floods of tears. <laughs> And me, in the middle of it all, going, this is brilliant! I love it! <laughs> yeah. Can I come back? <laughs> um, not really understanding what was going on. So that, that was the start of my um, tenure as a, as a Wednesday fan. But of course, it was the, the, the best time for it. Because then, after yeah. that, season after, promoted, uh, we won the League Cup. Uh, season after that, we uh, finished third, qualified for Europe. So the season after that, we were in Europe. And, um, and then we don't talk about anything after that. Yeah, yeah. after that. Yeah, Wembley three times. Um, and then it's been absolutely crap since then. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. James, and welcome to the podcast. It's a pleasure to have you on board, old boy. Um, and uh, right, so let's, let's crack on, shall we? Um, we've talked about the players, we've talked about the bosses, we've talked about our new wonderful setup. Let's talk about the old girl herself, Hillsborough. Um, a bit of a, a spit and polish going off, chaps. Um, obviously, we've all seen the grass growing. Um, Wednesday's been kind enough to show us the marvellous, wonderful, fantastically interesting time lapse videos of that. Um, and of course, the new scoreboard is, seems to be on its way. The framework is there. Um, Eddie, I know you're chomping at the bit for this one, old boy. Fire away. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to be honest here. I've, I've been a bit of a stadium geek since I was a kid. One of the things that first attracted me to to football and, and to Wednesday in particular was you know, just being in a stadium and, and looking at every bit of it and, and how they all fit together and all that sort of thing. So this has been something that I've been waiting for for years and years and years. The idea that not only would we finally have um, a, a, a HD video scoreboard that is presumably only being created and, and installed there because Mr. Chancery wants to do a live Wednesday week televisual podcast every single home game, <laughs> um, but also the ama- the Deso pitch. It's like it's it's grass, but also plastic grass at the same time, um, surrounded by blue running track. I you know this is just this is we're living in the future at this point here, and this is coming from someone who has spent the majority of the last four years tramping the Wednesday night flag down to the front of the cop. Um, unfurling it and furling it back again um, to find that basically the, 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 the cement bag is just full of stones and pebbles and, and, uh, and Steve Ellis, he's in there as well. Um, you know, so <laughs> effectively, this, you know, this is an upgrade for everyone who has a job to do on match day as well. So I'm, I am more than happy with this because, as we said on the last podcast, um, you want a statement of intent. We weren't signing players last time round, but we all talked last time. It was pretty much clutching at straws. Well, we're not signing players, but we're going to get a bloody big telly. Uh, you know, now it looks like the players that we're signing need an arena that we are proud of, that, that justify them being there. And it looks like by having a, a semi-plastic pitch surrounded by blue tarmac with a massive telly in the corner, we're kind of keeping up with the Joneses, and I'm more than happy. I think the big question, though, is, is, is whether or not the catering will be improving. <laughs> Good luck with that. Because, because how any, any club, uh, last season on a couple of occasions, uh, they, they uh, ran out of Bovril once. I can understand sure, they ran out of Bovril. And a set but, fire uh, to the bloody place. One, one week they, they had Bovril, but they'd run out of um, the, um, the lids for the cups. 
Amazing. Yeah, how, how do you not order the same number of lids as you order the puzzle? <laughs> Just by <like> basic maths. <laughs> if Sheffield went to stuff when he got basic maths, we wouldn't be in the mess we've been in for the last 15 years, old boy. Uh, right, on with Pop. Um, let's have a little chat about, obviously, our first game um, of pre-season. Alton Town. Uh, Miss Marriott, were you there, old boy? I, I was indeed, yes. Um, I, I don't remember a massive amount of it. Um, due to <laughs> due to a visit to the Sheffield Tap before getting the train to um, to Alfreton, and I was also yeah, I was also stood just uh, a couple of yards behind Tango in the second half, which meant that um, I, I I couldn't hear much of what was was going on, and I was more interested in him forgetting the words to our songs. Um, lads, lads, I'm going to call it now. James is a keeper. I, you know, he, I I'm, I'm, I'm about to propose. I think. <laughs> Um, yes, and we did. Um, we, we did uh, head off about halfway through the first half to try and find the bar inside the stadium, uh, where the the rule was very strange. So the rule in the in the bar, which is actually inside the ground, was if you have a beer in your hand, you are not allowed to see what is happening on the pitch. Okay. Uh, so even even though there was um, a little walkway from where you walked in the bar, if you stood in that walkway, you could see out of the door onto the football pitch, a steward would stand in your way to, to, to stop you being able to see. So you'd move to the side and the steward would then move to block your view. Um, so it's very, very strange. Uh, but I did see a fair bit of the match. Um, and, yeah, I thought it was probably what you'd expect from the first game. We, we didn't seem like a well-gelled unit. I thought there was uh, there was some decent bits of play. I thought that it's, it's going to take a while for us to kind of get all our new players to, to gel together, which... Is, is why you play pre-season friendlies, isn't it? To kind of help you uh, get there with that. But I thought there were some bright sparks there. And like I said, I thought um, Ross Wallace looked good in the second half. Uh, Jack Hunt, obviously, very good at, at getting forward. Um, and a, a person that I completely forgot existed, uh, Ryan, is it Crowsdale that we, we brought in from Stoke, mm. one of the young Yeah, absolutely. He looked good years. on the highlights, I've got to say. I don't know where he's been for the last few years, but, um, yeah, he looked really good. Very unlucky not to score in the second half. Um, and looks like a real bright spark. Maybe someone we might want to send out on, on loan, get a bit of experience. But um, you know, it's been a while since we've had a good young player that's that's come through. So um, I thought a lot of potential there. Well, looked like he, uh, obviously, as uh, Eddie mentioned there, on the highlights, he, he, he nicked the uh, ball in midfield for the actual goal as well. Yeah. Mm, talking. Uh, of course, as you mentioned there, James, uh, the other bit of news from there is his poor old tango, bless him. Um, <laughs> how long have we been singing these songs? Um, <laughs> how this, this, this was quite <laughs> astounding. I mean, I'm not. I, I, you know, Tango's a he's, he's a nice enough guy. I'm not accusing him of having one too many shandies. Um, but he, he actually he forgot the words to the songs that we were singing in the second half. And um, I'm not being funny, but this is Sheffield Wednesday. We've sung the same ten songs for 25 years. <laughs> how how can you forget the words to them? Look, like, like anyone, th- look, this is a pre-season game. So one of my favourite tango moments was uh, a couple of seasons ago, we had a, a pre-season game at Scunthorpe, like we have this season as well. And um, it was a, a burning hot day. You know, this is the sort of day where you expect tango to be in his element because he turns up, you know, strips his top off, etc., uh, in minus ten. Degrees. So on a you know a, a boiling hot uh, late July day in Scunthorpe, you'd think he'd be there. But no, he turned up and he's wearing a vest. And I was like, actually, <laughs> Tango is just the same as the players. You need to actually get up to match fitness. And so what he needed to do was have a few games to ease himself back into it. And that involves wearing more clothes and not quite knowing the words to the to the songs. So. I don't know why, why you're hating on him, because uh, he basically, he's, 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 he's got a regime. No, I'm, I'm a big Tango fan. Um, he, he always makes a laugh, because all the way through the game, he was particularly the second half, he was singing songs just at our substitutes. He didn't watch a second of the actual match. He was singing songs at the substitutes all the way through the game. As soon as the full-time whistle goes, and you go, you all right, Tango? He goes, oh, yeah, I'm fine. How are you? Completely normal. Just <laughs> it, it's, it's all a big act. He, he just gets in character, the Tango character. Uh, he's actually a very refined um, and, and, and lovable young man. Of course he is. <laughs> M- maybe not young. <laughs> uh, right, so I think uh, we're just about ready to wrap it up, uh, unless you chaps do have any other business on there. Well, I was, I was thinking of starting a new segment that we're probably going to forget about after week one. Uh, I'm going to go with Fudgies Fun Football Facts. Yeah, let's go with that. Yeah. <laughs> That's a big uh, hashtag. Crack on. Yeah, that's, that's what we're going to go with. I've just got two stories in the world of football that I must bring up. The first one, you've probably seen it, the Grimsby Town fan with the inflatable shark. 
<laughs> uh, I, I love this story. The Grimsby Town fan has got an inflatable shark and they beat Barnet 3-1 uh, back in February and uh, <laughs> the Barnet steward got quite the, the braying from uh, from the Grimsby the Town fan with an inflatable shark. And my favourite bit of any, any newspaper story is when, you know, like have you seen these ones that turn up on Twitter where they go, this naughty kid's not allowed to go to prom. And then there's a photo of them looking quite forlorn. Do you know what I mean? Oh, look at me, I can't even go to prom. <laughs> They've done that with this story on the BBC website. And it's the man holding an inflatable shark. And it's an absolute treat of a story. But my favourite one, my favourite, my favourite... <laughs> Funny football story of recent times, and you must have seen this. Whole city sponsorship for next year. <laughs> don't, right. don't you right. ever say anything bad about Flamingo Land, right? <laughs> Some of the most formative experiences of my young life were at that theme park. I think that might have been, the, the, no, I can't even go into that story for uh, because of kids listening. I tell you what, let's just say what, some of the most formative experiences of my life were in the woods in that theme park. <laughs> I just, I tell you ask. For me, I, I, I empathise so much with the whole city fans right now. Do you know what I mean? They, they, they've lost their Oriental endorsement, and all of a sudden now they're sponsored by Flamingo Land, which has got to be the worst logo I've ever seen. <laughs> See, I, I, I honestly thought that the Mr. Tom days were, were worse than the Chupa Chup yeah. days, <laughs> when uh, we used to have promo girls throwing Mr. Tom bars into the crowd and people diving out of the way because they didn't want to catch it. <laughs> <laughs> on, on the subject of um, funny stories from, uh, from the world of football over the summer, have you seen the photo of the new, is it Partick Thistle mascot? Oh, my oh, word. Oh, amazing. What scenes. is that? <laughs> no, I, I'm Googling it right now. Hang oh, on. You, you it's going to be a flying Google here now. The it, best reaction ever. Is it ready? If what you want for a mascot is an Incan representation of the <laughs> sun god. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? <laughs> I can't wait while Ozzy's on his, uh, his uh, mascot sports day that they have and see that great big picture of oh, look, e- Even bloody Barney is going to give him pelters, let's be honest. <laughs> uh, Just, what is that? A, a thistle? A, a it, thistle? Looks, it, looks like, it looks like a pissed up Pokemon. <laughs> yes, it absolutely does. What? I don't, why? What is, I don't, <laughs> what is it? It's artistic, old boy. Oh, my God. I always wonder what happened to the sun after Teletubby's finished. <laughs> <laughs> so one last little story, chaps, um, and I'm not sure of the truth of it. I don't know if you guys have heard it, but apparently um, Mr. Jeremy Hellan was uh, late for a team meeting uh, the other day. <laughs> yes. a- actually uh, borrowed a-, a young lad's bike to, to-, to bike to the ground, and uh, when he took it back, gave him 20 quid for his troubles. <laughs> and I love this. Even if this isn't true, and I-, <laughs> I-, I want to believe that it is, because that would suggest that Carlos Caravan of Love runs a very, very <laughs> tight ship when it comes to training, that Jeremy Hellan is so scared of turning up late that he nicks a kid's bike and then gives him some money for it. So what I'm hoping... <laughs> is that Carlos actually has the Portuguese version of Tony Toms with him. <laughs> and anyone that's late for training basically gets sent up into, like, Greno Woods for a 30-mile <laughs> forced march. Uh, and that's why they're doing it. So, oh, yeah. Th- th- again, it's another example that we are now in a new system. Uh, you know, and we, we, We've got the best of sports science going on. That Jeremy Elan, who, let's be honest, never looked like he gave a toss. Uh, at any point in the last two seasons, that he will steal a child's bike in order to not be late for training. <laughs> that, to me, is a football club that's on the up. <laughs> uh, right then, Charles. So I think that'll bring this evening's proceedings to a close. As always, it has been a pleasure, gentlemen. Uh, obviously, we're all looking forward vastly to next season. I, I can also say I have not been this excited for the football season since 1992. I, actually, bear, bear in mind as well, I mean, look, I mean, uh, the, the, the undercut's back. I've seen people with centre partings. Uh, <laughs> Sheffield right, Wednesday yeah. are signing players. I, and, and I think we've gone back in time. 
<laughs> oh, I'm, I'm going to head down to the market uh, in, in the next couple of days because there will be tie-dyed Wednesday t-shirts and yep. a beach towels sporting the Sheffield Wednesday logo, completely un- unofficial and unlicensed. Yep. When I, I see those, I know we're back. I'm going to dig out my global hypercolour t-shirt and my LA gear trainers and yep. uh, just enjoy it. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> James, thank you very, very much for joining us, old boy. How do, how do people get in touch with you for hate mail, James? Um, <laughs> so so my, uh, my Twitter handle is at James Marriott, but I'm not going to tell you how to spell that, so hopefully people will tweet someone else. <laughs> <laughs> at James Carvalho. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, at Tango Sheffield. <laughs> Eddie, if people want to get a view, old boy, what's your Twitter handle? So, I am at Sausage Arms, as always, but I've had some really exciting news uh, this evening, which is that, despite the fact that I thought that it, this was, you know, something from the past, a relic of history, it sounds like the Wednesday Night Lounge at the Niagara uh, Centre is, is coming back again this year. And I Fantastic. think, because this is nailed on promotion season, I think we're going to be bringing the buzz back to the, to the Wednesday Night Lounge. So, I'm hoping that by the time... We've done a couple more of these, and we're into the swing of things again. Um, it's not good, just going to be at Sausage Arms on Twitter. You'll be able to come and sit and have a pint with me at the Wednesday Night Lounge before the match. And also a live podcast. Oh, always thinking. Oh, yes. <laughs> For Joe Boy, where can people follow your European nonsense? Well, listen, I'll be, uh, I'll be sat outside many a brasserie uh, or Irish speakeasy across Europe, uh, if, you, if you do need me. But um, if you if you do if you if you honestly if you don't like what I'm saying on this show I'm apologising and you can get hold of me at Beastie underscore. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm at Dan Fudge on Twitter. Uh, tell us what you think. And um, yeah, yeah, whatever, yeah. <laughs> of course, you can get hold of me over there on Twitter at uh, Lord H. That's L zero R D underscore H. You can also get over the show at T W W Cast, and um, uh, we're going to obviously try and get this this all up and running properly again. So uh, the, the Facebook has started to emerge again. So if you're on Facebook, by all means, uh, give us a little shout out there. Just do a search for the Wednesday Week, and you'll see us over there too. Uh, right then, chaps, it's been a pleasure. We are going to uh, obviously attempt to uh, be more regular. The final W in TWW may well have to change. What do we think, chaps? Are we going with Waffle? <laughs> Wednesday Waffle. It was better than the Wednesday whenever, let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, we shall, obviously it's going to be a promotion, so we're going to have a lot to talk about as well. So thank you very much for joining us. Be good, be safe, and we shall see you very, very soon. <laughs> Mascot is fucking frightening. <laughs> <laughs>